Welcome. Uh, this is a scripture and ministry interview series. My name is Hans Madawemi. I'm the managing director of the Henry Center. Next to me is Rob Moll, who is the director of publications at Trinity International University. And our guests today are Dr. Casely and Dr. Angela Esamua, who have been with us yesterday and today. Um, I guess I'll pass things over to Rob. Well, the SMOs have been uh, talking to the community here at Trinity about reverse missions. Uh, and when you're talking about missions, uh, you're talking about intercultural uh, relationships and cross-cultural uh, interactions. And um, so my first question for uh, both of you is, you have a cross-cultural marriage, uh, a Ghanaian and a Ugandan. Uh, and often we think of uh, Africa as all being the same, but um, I've had the privilege of being in both countries, and I know for, uh, from firsthand experience that uh, they're not the same. Uh, so I wonder if you could talk to us a little bit about um, your own cross-cultural experiences within your family. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure. We're delighted to be part of the uh, series here at the Henry uh, Center. Uh, Angela and I, as you rightly said, are from two ends of Africa, uh, but the good news is that God in his providence had prepared us even before we, we came together. Uh, there are issues of uh, cross-cultural understanding and differences that we always have to work through as part of our marriage, which uh, might be unique because we are from different parts of Africa, but there are some issues that are common to all marriages that I believe uh, everyone can uh, uh, take uh, a lesson from. Um, one of the ways in which I believe God was preparing me to marry an East African at a time when I did not know how I was going to end up uh, as a married man uh, was to allow me to stay in the city of Nairobi for three months, uh, five years before we got married, five years before I met Angela. And uh, those three months, uh, I came to understand and to cherish and to appreciate the culture of East Africa. Of course, I was in Kenya. I wasn't in Uganda. Um, some of the differences that re were really um, interesting were the, um, the uh, appreciation that people had for land, uh -huh. for land. And uh, the reason why they had the appreciation for land was that is where you were buried. So you needed, if you were a person of worth and means, you needed land so that not only would you build a house, but that's the place where you're going to be buried. Um, in my part of the world, which is West Africa, we emphasized more a house. Uh -huh. You would think that, of course, a house needs to be on land, you know, yeah. but um, it, it's a, a different uh, because in West Africa, we buried people in cemeteries. In, in East Africa, people are buried near, on the, what they call the shamba, close to your house, homestead. Yeah. Um, I came to love the food, the shapati and the uh, other uh, delicious varieties that they had in East Africa. I came to uh, uh, appreciate the, the very dynamic political situation that they had there and uh, how forthright people were. I came to appreciate the churches there, uh, many of them very similar to churches in, the, in, in West Africa, in Ghana. And also I came to appreciate the ecumenical organizations that were functioning in Nairobi. And God was giving me this exposure uh, without any uh, sense. I had no sense that I would end up marrying someone from East Africa. So five years fast forward, when we met, uh, there were some things that were already uh, I was used to and I uh, had almost like falling in love with that culture before falling in love with Angela. And uh, that was the way God was preparing us. But maybe I'll turn it over to Angela and you can, you can say some more. Mm -hmm. Hopefully I'll agree, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, indeed, uh, I think uh, the Lord was preparing me to also marry a West African because as a medical student in, at Makere University Medical School, I was the vice president of the Federation of African Medical Students Association and traveled to Liberia and also to Nigeria and fell in love with West Africa. And on coming back to medical school, everybody said, you are going to marry a West African. <laughs> uh, so that was you know, way back in medical school. And uh, going forward, uh, I very much appreciated the West African culture. And uh, when I met Casely, um, it looked like we had you know, known each other before. But you're right in the sense that uh, Africa is often misunderstood. Uh, many people believe that it's uh, a homogeneous continent, but it's quite heterogeneous in the sense of having more than 50 
countries, uh, many languages and language groups, uh, countless uh, numbers of them. And uh, it is a continent that is vast. Uh, even the United States uh, fits within the uh, African land ma mass. And uh, we have, I'm from Uganda, which is in East Africa. It's a landlocked country. Kaisley comes from Ghana, which is a coastal country. Very, very different. Uh, the food is different in the sense that it, the West African um, menu is affected by the spices that were part of the Indian trade along the coastal routes. In Africa, we are landlocked. I'm not a, a seafood eater, and that has been a difference between our, our marriage. So it has been a very interesting uh, journey for both of us. But uh, the, just to add on, uh, some of the similarities that we encountered when we uh, got married was the fact that we had um, all had missions education mm -hmm. uh, as a result of missionaries going to Africa, establishing schools, yes. uh, and very good schools, by the way. Uh, we were privileged to be part of some of the top schools in our countries. And so when we met, uh, the way we looked at things, our perspectives on life, on the Western world, even on, on development in Africa, on the church, were very similar. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so we are direct beneficiaries of people's sacrifice over the years. But there are, there are some very... Um, uh, distinct differences. For instance, my uh, ethnic group, the Fantis in Ghana, are matrilineal in inheritance, okay. and, uh, and that makes for some very complex dynamics in, in, in relationships, yeah. uh, which means that my sisters and my mother and my nieces and all the people who are the women in our family are culturally very significant. Yeah. Uh, um, it, when you go to a gathering, you might look like the men are in control, but be careful, <laughs> because you might be misreading things. And you would have uh, thought that would make it easier. So you married up. Yeah, very nice. <laughs> so it's uh, all, all those dynamics. But you're right. The, the, the cultures are different. And uh, I think uh, uh, it's unfortunate when you sort of lump them all together and think that, well, you are African, so this is how you look at things. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, and Uganda is actually quite patrilineal in its, yeah. uh, you know, the, the, the man and the men take a major role yeah. in the family yeah. and uh, being leaders in the family as well. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> well, that's fascinating. I'm, I thank you for sharing your experience. Um, um, it's important, I think, as, as we Americans uh, become more engaged uh, in, in issues in Africa to have a better understanding of, of the continent. So yes, I appreciate absolutely. that. Yeah. Um, and it's also fascinating uh, as you talk about growing up in missionary schools and um, and your experience uh, sort of being ministered to mm -hmm. in a sense from yes. uh, Western missionaries. Um, and now as Africans are coming to the West, both to Europe and, and North America, uh, and becoming missionaries, I wonder if, if, if I could ask you, uh, Casey, just about if you could provide us just some sense of an overview of mm -hmm. what. Uh, what this reverse missions process uh, is looking like. Yeah. Well, the, um, a lot of people who are migrating to the West um, for economic reasons, uh, sometimes for political uh, asylum, refugee. And uh, the first thing we really need to say is that uh, we, we thank God that the West is so hospitable. Uh, no matter what you say, it is because it is hospitable that people come uh, to these areas and uh, it is because when they come here they realize that uh, it will be an opportunity to fulfill what God has purpose for them in their life. Uh, but it, it long, as they come and as they um, get more into the society, it dawns on them that God brought them here for purposes beyond themselves, beyond becoming economically uh, better off or beyond raising their children, maybe sending remittances home and uh, supporting families home as immigrants do. And more often than not, they begin to see themselves as missionaries, that God prepared them from where they came to the U.S., to Europe, uh, to be missionaries, to where, where, where God has placed them. Um, and that's always a very, very um, interesting and a very uh, heavy responsibility that they take on, having come to that, that understanding. Yeah. <clears throat> I would think that that's a tremendous uh, mental mental transition, yes. um, going from you know uh, coming to the U.S. to say support your family, even support your family back home. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a tremendous responsibility in itself, and then to say, well, I'm also going to be a missionary, yes. Yes. Uh, is a is a is a massive additional uh, burden. Yes. Um, so what what happens um, uh, in in someone who has come? 
come to the U.S. for economic reasons uh, to sort of cause that sh that, uh, that change. shift to go on. Yeah. Well, the the I think some of the significant factors are that immigrants travel with their religion, with their faith. And so wherever they are relocated, they feel that they first need to practice their faith. And uh, knowing the, the, the shift in the center of gravity from the Western world to the non-Western world as far as Christianity is concerned, you have people who are coming to the Western world who are used to maybe going to three or four church-related meetings a week. Now, they come to the Western world, and that time is sort of freed up. They can do a second job, or they can, um, they can be engaged in secular um, occupation and, and make money. But that yearning, that desire is still there, mm -hmm. that desire to continue cultivating um, uh, sort of a walk with the Lord, that is much more um, engaging than what they see around is, is still there. And so usually they band together with people from their own background, uh, uh, their own denomination, their own language group, and uh, start meeting as a Bible class or as a small group. Uh, usually they start by prayer. And the, 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 the more fascinating thing is that they are also using a lot of technology these days. <laughs> there are many, many churches that have prayer meetings every morning. Yeah. And they do it by phone. It's a phone in. Yeah. And it's, it's very interesting. I mean, they just give you the number. You call at 4 a.m. or 5 a.m. And you are part of a one-hour-long prayer meeting yeah. by phone. Different voices. And uh, sometimes if it's a Pentecostal a prayer meeting, everyone is praying at the same time. <laughs> But it, it, there's a sense of doing that together yeah. with others. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And there's a sense of, uh, of belonging, of knowing that you are bearing each other's burdens, you know what's on people's hearts. And, and as they do that, as they uh, try to nurture their faith in a place which is, as it were, alien to them, in a situation where um, they are always sort of uh, feeling like, well, we are here, but we don't really belong to the place, we cannot wear the, the clothes that we are used to, we cannot use, uh, eat the food that we are used to, we cannot worship even in the way that we are used to, we don't speak the language that we were brought up with. As they, as they do that and they band together, uh, their eyes are opened to see that, well, the Lord placed us here for something more than ourselves. The Lord placed us here with people around us whom we can reach with the love of Christ. Yes. Yeah. And just to add to that, um the, that burden of responsibility that you alluded to earlier and what Casey has just said is, is extremely strong. Whether at the time when the missionaries came and uh, brought to the Methodist missionary schools where Casey got educated or the Catholic missionary schools where I got educated, that burden of responsibility is major uh, on our parents, many of whom were the first to graduate from high school or from uh, college in, in our villages. And then even us, our generation, we're among the few very, very small, 1% of the population who were able to go to high school, go to uh, college, and even go to postgraduate, uh, to have a postgraduate education. So that burden of responsibility weighs heavily on us as uh, children who benefited from the missionaries who first came. And coming here, um, being in the front row of missions, as Casely calls it, where you're sitting here at tables where many uh, U.S. or European churches are trying to send people abroad, that responsibility even weighs on us more that we have to help even those who are trying to do missions here do missions better. Yeah. And uh, that responsibility weighs heavily on us in the sense that um, this is then we are now reverse missionaries in the sense that we are trying to educate those here in Europe yeah. and the U.S. How can you do this better? Yeah, sure. And uh, a key feature of doing it better for us is it's about relationships. Uh -huh. yes. Yeah. Uh -huh. Just to uh, jump in, not this might be a <clears throat> somewhat difficult question mm. but, and a personal one, but mm. um, you know, just to paint a scenario, you often you often uh, find a couple like you who are from international backgrounds and who come to the U.S. and then start a family. And then you have children who are raised in this cultural context. And I'm th thinking particularly of a, a Christian family. Um, and, and, and I've seen this quite often, and I've seen this struggle quite often. And it, and it's, it can be heartbreaking in the sense that the parents come, might come from a very deeply Christian, kind of pious understanding of life and the way they see the world as Christians. The children grow up. And then, you know, just sort of vying with other com competing kind of voices, not least at school and TV and mm -hmm. so on. Mm -hmm. And with international families particularly, you, you find almost 
um, the parents are moving in one direction, the children in a moving whole in different other. direction. And, yes. and, um, and sometimes the language thing makes it yes. a lot worse. Yes. You know, so that the children are almost adults to the parents culturally. Mm -hmm. But then, the, and the faith perspective then, uh, for the kids, it's hard to take their, children, their parents' faith that seriously because of, you know, how, how did you, for you, did you, have you faced that struggle? Or, uh, do you have any reflections on well, that? That's it's a uh, really difficult problem. It is, it yeah. is. And I Very think you've, you've hit the nail right on the head. Actually, um, there, there are just so many things that come out of what you have said. The first is the fact that one of the things that immigrants face when they come to the U.S., one of the biggest um, cultural shocks that they experience is that the U.S., even though it's known all over the world as a Christian country, mm. uh, is very secular in orientation. Right. And, um, and, and coming as we are from sub-Saharan Africa, where maybe more than 60% of the people identify themselves as Christians, you come to a place where you have also maybe more than 60% identify themselves as Christians, but the degree of, um, of uh, nominality is very high. And uh, it's almost like they are culturally Christians, but mm -hmm. what that means doesn't translate into everyday life. And if you were to just look at the West through the media, the movies that come out of Hollywood, and that's all the sense of the West that you had, you wouldn't think that's a Christian nation. You know? So it is into this environment that we come, uh, and the Lord gives us children into this, in this environment. And you're right, we have to always struggle to see if some of the uh, benefits and the blessings that we have received as Christians who were born and raised up in Africa can be passed on to our children. There are competing factors there, uh, but I think by and large it is in recognizing the differences that helps us to help the kids also. Uh, one of the ways in which I think our kids have been very much helped has been the fact that uh, we proudly uh, wear our African clothes uh, yeah. each time we get the opportunity. Unfortunately, today we are uh, Chicago, uh, Chicago cold. <laughs> we, can't, we can't put on these. Yeah. So that has been, and, and they have felt comfortable about that, and that is part of their identity. Uh, but I think one of the more significant things we've been blessed with is to take them back to Africa, to connect them to Africa. And maybe, Angela, you can share how that, that has made a difference in the, in the lives of the kids. Yes, uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, I think you raise an incredibly important uh, issue for immigrants, and especially us as parents of three children mm -hmm. aged 16, 13, uh, and 10 years. Uh, we, I think, have had the advantage that though we come from Uganda and Ghana, where we do not speak the same language, uh, because of the missionary education we had, we speak English. Right. And that's our common language, right. other than love. Right. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. Our love language. But uh, the English has allowed us to be able to communicate, and obviously, you know, there are layers of communication. But our children have been able to see that, that um, and, and know English as their first language. Uh, we haven't had the privilege, unfortunately, of... Um, having them understand our languages because right. we don't speak them to each One other. Language, yeah. But uh, over time, what has um, been ingrained in them is that though our parents speak English, they are very much uh, identify themselves as Ugandan and as Ghanaian. Mm -hmm. And from the time they were children, Ghana and Uganda have been foremost in their mind in terms yes. of at home, whether it's artifacts, whether it is paintings, whether it is books, whether it is... Um, uh, going to Africa, as he has said, uh, we have been very privileged to take our children to Africa, both to Uganda and Ghana, uh, five times, I believe, to Ghana and three times to Uganda, to the point that the children now know Uganda and know Ghana, right. where they are, what it's about. Right. Uh, they know their relatives there. They've yes. met them there. Right. Many of our relatives have been able to come to the United States. Uh, Casey's mother and my mother have visited the United States quite a number of times. Mm -hmm. So the children have identified with somebody. Mm -hmm. They have a relationship with a grandmother. Right. Uh, they have a relationship with their uncles. Right. Uh, the other thing, too, is that, yes, they have seen us dress in African clothes, and mm -hmm. we're very comfortable with them at the beginning. Uh, right. They were very much you know, reticent about doing that, like we, right. we are going to be too different. Right. But seeing our comfort right. in our clothing and our culture has, right. you know, Know, propel them to the point where they are comfortable even uh, wearing yes. their clothes and talking about Africa. So I have a, just to piggyback on that, mm -hmm. I have this theory, I'm just curious if you think there's anything to it, but um, and I, I guess I, I'd have to try and put it carefully, but it seems as if to be a Christian um, in a way that's, in a way that, um, 
kind of fits with the tradition and, and pleases God, particularly in a world that's often conflicting with those values. Um, what, you know, the Bible sometimes talks about being in the world and not of the world mm -hmm. um, and how um, the powers of the, the, the uh, devil is a prince of this world mm -hmm. and the powers of darkness are uh, leading many people astray. There's a kind of dislocation from the world that a Christian is supposed to experience, yes. you know, but being a child of God and knowing that, you quote, need, unquote, yeah. this world is not my home. Now, that kind of, that um, sense of dislocation, if I'm raised in the, if I'm raised in the majority culture and I, I, I'm a majority person and I'm a Christian, sometimes that sense of dislocation is a little different difficult to experience because I'm yes. like everyone else. Yes. Mm -hmm. But if you're a minority in some way, it, this is my thesis, I'm wondering what yeah. you think, yeah. that, that mm -hmm. it sometimes can lend itself to, to entering into that sense of dislocation in a good way. Mm -hmm. So that mm -hmm. if I'm a teenager and you have the peer group pressure and you have all these sorts of challenges, and if I'm like everyone else, mm -hmm. then it might it be much more, it might, it, it's just difficult to kind of hold the straight and narrow. Whereas if I'm, I mean, perhaps like, I'm wondering, like your, your kids, I already have a sense of dislocation a little bit, just culturally. I think and that's actually a good thing. And so that hel yes. helps my sense as a Christian yeah. even. Yeah. Yeah. What do you think about that? Well, I, I think you're right. Yeah. And I yeah. think um, all of us, whether we're from minority or majority, wherever we are, right. I think our faith is enriched when we go and try to be part of things that we are not used to, when we go and be part of things that are beyond our comfort zone, um, when we go and be part of worship services, for instance. And of course, at the beginning, it, it, it looks awkward that, okay, everyone is raising their hands, or these people are dancing. Even though the music is very danceable music, I've been in churches where you know, we, 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 don't, we don't express things that way, you know. Mm -hmm. but, but people take these things literally. Let's raise our hands, they raise our hands. Let's dance, they dance, you know. And I think being part of, of these things that are outside of our comfort zones enriches, actually, right. our faith. Right. Um, you, you realize that you are part of a global family. A family that has so much diversity and variety, a family that looks at the Bible um, in many respects, interpreting the major themes the same way, mm -hmm. but, but bringing their own cultural understanding to it and actually enriching it, not necessarily invalidating it, but enriching it. And, and I think the, the more we are open to that, um, the, the better we become and deeper we grow in our faith. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. Yeah, very good question. Uh, yeah. I think dislocation does provide a protective value mm -hmm. for yes. them, mm -hmm. absolutely. And um, to really answer your question about you know, how then do they maintain their faith, uh, one thing that we've uh, been able to show our children is that the God that we serve is uh, the same that the God the American culture is trying to serve, mm -hmm. sometimes serves it well, and the one which our people also try to serve and so sometimes uh, serve well. Mm -hmm. And so keep him central to everything. Mm -hmm whether the peer pressure, whether our cultures sometimes mm -hmm. do clash at, in, the, in that whole context, as, right. in, as unstable as it is, right. you know, God is, 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 uh, is a foundation for right. you. Yes. And we've tried to institute um, literally our own Bible study as a family, that right. every night we do gather to pray. Right. We do gather to pray, and at least let that be a constant mm -hmm. throughout our lives. And that has helped the children tremendously mm -hmm. um, through their peer pressure and through... Um, the American culture that assaults them, right. and uh, the African culture that also assaults them in a different yeah. way. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> yes, yes. yes. Good. Yeah, yeah, good. That's fascinating. I don't. I. I um, it's funny because I'm the person from the majority culture, <laughs> but not on the stage. <laughs> Non-African, and I'm thinking about my own kids uh, and their experience. Yes. Um, and one one thing that has has come up repeatedly is the importance of relationships. Yes. Yeah. Um, that that your children are able to go and and develop relationships, you know, with your families in, in your respective countries, and um, uh, and I'm just wondering if you could talk a little bit about um, the importance just of of developing cross cultural relationships, mm -hmm. whether it's you know uh, Westerners going to Africa mm -hmm. and and on short term missions trips as you're involved in, Angela. Um, 
or Africans uh, moving from, you know, outreach from, you know, the immigrant community into yes. the broader community yes. at large. Yes. 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 I think the relationships are, are key, and developing that is really what helps out in the outreach. The, um, as we said, the, the immigrants usually come to um, the U.S. or the Western world for economic reasons, but when they are exposed to the secular nature of life here and they realize that uh, people here need the Lord as much as people who are back home, it sort of transforms them. And, and the way to go about it is really not uh, to do it in any um, sort of strident way. Uh, it is to find subtle ways of, of, of relating to others. Uh, we all come into contact with people at the gas stations. Uh, almost, I would, I would say that maybe 50% of people who serve at gas stations were not born in the U.S. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I don't know about the Chicago area, but where I live, yeah, um, more than 70% of those who drive taxi Taxis, cabs yeah. in, in, in Washington, Washington D.C. Yeah. were not born in the U.S., yeah. you know. Uh, but they are literally the ones who are taking, making the government work from one department to the other. And people sit in those taxi cabs, you know, and people engage in them, with them in conversation. Um, or you go to a grocery shop and uh, people who are there. But I, I think the thing that the immigrants do well is to try to enter into relationship with people like that and to try to um, go beyond a mere hello and, okay, how are you doing? How is the family? Um, and before long, it comes to, okay, for me, uh, the story of Christ in my life is a more significant story. And I want you to join me at church, or I want to take you to this gathering, and then it, it goes on from there. Yeah, so relationships are sort of the key that helps them to transition from just being migrants here to becoming missionaries yeah. in the U.S. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, yes, absolutely. I mean, as, as Christians, we're called to have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ and to discern what that means and go into all its you know, tributaries within our lives. And so in many ways, as missionaries who go out, we encourage uh, individuals who we both train and support that it is about relationships, that when you go there um, and uh, serve in that village, try and build a relationship with one, two, three people. If you take a photograph of someone, do not just take a photograph of an individual and let it be a faceless name. Let it be a person. Let it be Nelima, you know, the six-year-old child of... Yeah. Uh, Sikola, who's married to Joseph, and they have HIV AIDS, and uh, the, she's pregnant, and she's going to have a baby, you see, so you build a relationship and know that person as a human being, and then through that, you are able to pray for them, you're able to potentially support them as a family, and they are on your heart, and you are therefore there for them, because it's not about changing global poverty in one fell swoop. Uh, in your short-term mission trip or, you know, in going back three or four times. We can't do that, but at least you will help that family, that child at that time. Mm -hmm. Same thing when we're here in terms of um, our reverse missions agenda in the, in the sense that we want to build a relationship with you. Yeah. Don't uh, see me coming to your church, whether it's a Hispanic or a person from Afghanistan or Iran or um, Ugandan, and pass me by. Stop me and ask me, uh, who are you? Where are you from? Um, you, you, you have an accent. There's nothing wrong with asking that. You know, say, where are you from? And then build a relationship with me. Find out about my country. Um, what's going on in terms of persecution and uh, uh, your people? Uh, and how can I help? Uh, whether it's in the immigrant community in Chicago, in the, in the South Side, or it's in Baltimore, or perhaps our church can build bridges through your, my relationship with you to your country back home. Most of the partnerships that I know of uh, between churches in the U.S. and churches um, in Africa have been through relationships. It mm. might have been um, someone who knew someone who knew this church leader. Um, rarely do you have people, and some people do that, I would say unfortunately, but rarely do you have mm. people who would just go on the website and say, okay, we want to do ministry in X country, <laughs> and uh, who is on the website in X country? And not, more often than not, that's not the best way to go about it. I know that God can use that to direct people. There's no two ways about that. But um, uh, if, you, if you know someone who knows someone, uh, because we are such a, a global village these days that if you take any, any 10 square mile um, area, there will be people from so many different countries. And uh, if you know someone who knows someone and you make the effort and the attempt to really 
foster a relationship with them, you can then through them also have a relationship with uh, churches and with groups outside of the U.S. Yeah. 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 So yesterday, you, um, your talk was on, at least in part, on short-term missions mm -hmm. and the, what God can do through that mm -hmm. and uh, a number of experiences that you've had from your home church, um, and that, which was really helpful. You know, for some of our listeners, um, some people who have looked into this, there's sometimes a discussion about the value of short-term missions. Mm -hmm. And you do hear criticisms, um, and sometimes strident ones, mm -hmm. about whether the very idea of short-term missions itself is something that some of our older um, brothers and sisters who were missionaries would, would would really frown on, you know, yes, yes, um, that, that we, that as a generation of Christians, perhaps we've lost the, you know, we've lost the stamina and the, 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 the nerve to, to, to do what it takes. And so we do this sort of um, tourism thing mm -hmm. and, you, you know, that kind of criticism. Yeah. What would you say to, to someone that. who's yeah. coming from that or has those concerns? Yeah. Well, in, in, there is some truth to that. Yeah, because if you were to go to Ghana or Uganda for two weeks, it doesn't compare with the person who 200 years ago mm -hmm. went to Ghana or Uganda and knew that they were going for life. Mm -hmm. And sometimes they packed all their clothing and everything in a coffin because right. they knew that most likely they were coming right. back, they were going to come back in that coffin. Right. So it doesn't compare at all, mm -hmm. I, I think. Absolutely. But I think the, the, um, God has, uh, through scientific discoveries, made it easier for us to travel. You know, these days you can go to almost everywhere within a day or two days. Um, and uh, through technology, we have better communication with, with people in the world. Uh, and so it has changed the way in which we do uh, most things. Uh, and so it should also change the way we do missions. Um, I think short-term missions is, in a sense, even a much more democratic, if I, I may put it that way, way of um, more people being involved. Uh, I think what makes the difference in short-term missions uh, success is, is training, training, training. And we really have no excuse for not training people well. I mean, you can, you can have a whole curriculum on the country of Ghana on, on a free website. I mean, you can just Google it and right. have so much. There's, there's, you, you can say, I'm going to visit Ghana uh, next week and start reading the newspapers in Ghana every day from now till the, the, the time you go. So by the time you, you land there, you know the things that are on people's minds. Right. Um, you, can, you can visit churches from these areas which are um, established by immigrants here. So if you put a lot of emphasis in the training and getting people to be aware of the cultural differences, of even the Christian differences that you might have, the way that they worship, the way that they um, go about their church life, uh, people will be in a much better position to, to enjoy the trip mm -hmm. and to benefit from it, mm -hmm. as well as to be a blessing to those that right. they go to meet. Uh, I think we, the, the problem is when we, we advertise it as if it is something that you just, all you need is just the money to pay for your fare, and then you go and then everything will be all right. right. I think that's, that's where the problem is. Mm -hmm. But I would say, um, without any doubt at all, that short-term missions is very valuable. Right. It is valuable for the good that it does to the people who uh, are on the receiving end. Right. It is valuable and very, very transformative for those that participate in it, who go, who, whose worldview is expanded, who realize all of a sudden we are members of a global family uh, with different economic uh, um, variables, and yet uh, some people who might have less are actually much more joyful than those of us right. who have more, right. and which challenges us to say, okay, so actually I don't need this much to be happy. Why am I so sad? Why right. do I need... Um, do I always complain about things when right. people uh, don't have all that? So it is valuable, but it needs to be done well. You, it needs you, to be done you well. You actually mentioned there were a lot of very moving stor um, stories and um, experiences that you mentioned. Mm -hmm. um, for those who maybe didn't hear um, your talk, do you, is there sort of maybe one example that you could share of someone who's been on short-term missions and, and yeah, experienced that yeah. valuable Sort of yes. Well, there are those who have come back and the, their whole um, career trajectories have changed. I mean, those who have come back and they've, whatever they were intending to do, they've, they are not doing that. We have people who are serving as missionaries, long-term missionaries. That's also one of the, of the values, by the way, that when people come back from 
uh, or rather that the vast majority of those who serve as long-term missionaries these days are those who have experienced short-term missions. So it's, it's a training ground for, right. for long-term right. missionaries, uh, right. if nothing at all. But there are people who come back and they do make um, life choices and decisions based on the fact that they are merely stewards of what they have. Uh, they, they, they don't own it to use it as they wish, but God has given them that, that property or whatever it is for a purpose. There are those who come back and um, they have this love uh, for the ministry, for the people that they were engaged with, that they established um, a not-for-profit or they try to raise funds to try and help and make a difference there. Um, so many different ways that people people have carried on. But Angela, maybe you can... Yes. I mean, a, a couple of other examples are uh, two women who have gone on a short-term mission trip with me to Uganda where their, their lives have really been broken. Um, you know, I re read a book by Kay Warren called Dangerous Surrender, and I think it captures what that really means, that you go to Africa, you go to see a person living with HIV AIDS and see the absolute um, destitution that they're living in and the fact that you are present just transforms their life. Mm -hmm. So the person whom you visited, their life is transformed that uh, a pastor had not even come to visit them, nobody had come to visit them and you see uh, that person being lifted up by somebody coming with a basin, giving them their first bath, giving them clothes, giving them um, medication. So you see that transformation but in the two women who have been part of our short-term missions uh, trips to Uganda, their own lives have been broken to the point where um, one met a young uh, man in Uganda and decided to sponsor his college education. And that is transforming that young man's sure. life going through college. Sure. And he or she is um, feeling this connection. You know, first of all, built that relationship and saying that I am helping a young man um, go into, um, to get an education that will really open up his life. The, se the second woman, um, she feels that uh, Uganda is a, a, a mission field for her. If she had it within her power and can make things work, she wants to go there as a medium or long-term missionary. And she's still working on that. Right. But um, she's very much connected to um, that village and to helping mm. those uh, living and affected by HIV AIDS there. But I think the vast majority of those that go come back and they look at their resources differently. Uh, how do we prioritize? What do we um, invest in? Uh, what do we use our money for? And, and it's, it's something that, that weighs on their minds each time that they have to make these decisions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering about the value of, of this sort of cross-cultural experience mm -hmm. when there are so many cross-cultural experiences available to Americans, even yes. people like myself, here in the U.S. Yes. And I think, you know, on the way home, uh, on the drive home, for me, I'll pass a Ukrainian Orthodox church. Yes. I'll pass a, an Egyptian Coptic church. Yes. I'll pass a mosque, um, another mosque under construction. Mm -hmm. uh, if I go to the library, I'll pass, uh, I'll, you know, speak with people uh, from Poland. Mm -hmm. I'll speak with Pakistanis. Uh, my daughter uh, at the public school um, where she would go to won't be a majority, um, mm -hmm. you know, she'll be one of, I think, something like 20% of uh, the white kids, which includes the immigrant Poles, right? <laughs> um, and so, um, so there are uh, abundant uh, cross-cultural experiences for people uh, here in the U.S. Yes. So I just wonder what, what is the value of, uh, of having that kind of experience. Obviously, it's a very different kind of experience uh, traveling to Africa. Yes, yes. Um, and, and for me, my own experience has been when I go overseas, I realize all the opportunities that I'm missing uh, right outside yes, my door. Yes, yes, um, yes. And, uh, and not paying attention to. Yes, so I just yes. wonder what you think about uh, yeah, that. Yeah. I think it's, bo it's both and. It's not either or. Um, we have, let me give you an example from my church, which is situated in a place where we are surrounded by probably the largest um, El Salvadorian community in our county. 
Uh, but we've not been able to have any relationship with the people in that community because of language, because they prefer uh, to worship at different churches. But then we have a missionary in El Salvador. So a team, actually two teams, went to serve in El Salvador. And they came back, and um, they just couldn't have enough of El Salvador. They were like, we need to continue this. We need to nurture this, yeah. this, this um, love that God has given us for El Salvador. Oh, by the way, there are El Salvadorians around here. <laughs> and uh, what do they need? Maybe we'll start an ESL. So now we have an English, English as a second, second language, language yeah. program every Wednesday at the church. Uh, it would have been difficult for them to have done that without going to El Salvador. Right. Yeah. But now that they are back, I can't stop them even from doing that. Yeah. You know, they're going to do it. Mm -hmm. And so uh, it sometimes is a roundabout way. <laughs> But it is helpful if mm -hmm. that's the way that God is going to open our eyes to the yeah. opportunities that we have around us. And, uh, and you're absolutely right. I mean, I think every church can have a cross-cultural connection if we can just mm -hmm. uh, have a survey of who is not part of the church, mm -hmm. but who is part of the community. Yeah. You know, the old, old concept of a parish, you know. Right. What is the parish that God is giving us? This is the community. Yeah. Who is in this community? And if you realize that there are... 20 or 30 different nationalities represented in the public school, most likely there are 30 or uh, so nationalities represented in the community. Right. And then you ask yourself, who is not in church on Sunday? Uh, how can we reach them? Yeah. What is it that they need? And one of the things which, you know, um, I think a service we can, we can offer to immigrant communities is, um, is uh, legal services on immigration, for instance. Yeah. I mean, there are many people who... Uh, fall through the cracks as far as immigration is concerned, not because they are here and they want to break laws, mm -hmm. but because either something expired in the uh, immigration status or the paperwork, um, was, the paperwork was not, was not uh, filled out right. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, very many little things. It's, you are not in any way trying to aid and abet anyone um, disobeying U.S. laws. You don't want to do that. But there is a lot of ministry that you can do. Yeah. Uh, with people, and that could be the bridge that you can use to um, to reach out to a community. Yeah, English yeah. as a second language, yes. uh, getting health insurance, uh, the health ins right. the health uh, infrastructure here is very complicated yeah. for many immigrants coming yeah. to the country for the first time, so many churches can do that, but yeah. absolutely, um, there are people in our community who, um, or places where we could have that cross-cultural experience, but just like we mentioned at the beginning, that it's not about saying, okay, there's a Coptic church there, let me just walk through the door and do yeah. a ministry. Right. You need yes, a relationship. Yeah, so how true. do you begin? Yeah. So unless you were riding on the bus and you're sitting next to you know, a person from Egypt next to you and then have a conversation and then say, okay, I'll come by your church. So it, it, you, the entry can be that. Yes. Or it could be that you went on a short-term mission to Egypt and yeah. then you went to the church and said, I have just come from a short-term yes. mission in Egypt. Can I tell you all about it? Or yeah, could yeah. one of you come to my church and I tell you about it? And then the entry point comes yeah. there. Yeah. yeah. So we need entry points. Yeah. Right. <laughs> it does give you a lot of credibility if you have a little bit of a sense for where they came from, where the immigrants came from. Uh, just to say that, well, I visited your country. They, they will give you all the time and attention <laughs> in the world. They will cook the meals for you because they know that you've experienced it. Yeah. And, and out of a, a spirit of hospitality and, and yeah. gratitude, really, not in any way um, trying to take advantage of you or anything. But, um, but you need to be open, open enough for that. Yeah. 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 I think we are out of time, but uh, it's been such a pleasure uh, having this conversation. We thank, we're so grateful for you, Casely and Angela for being with us and for sharing some of your wisdom with us today. Thank you very much. We really appreciate it. Thank, Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.